assets, it seemed logical that we should specialize in the study of high-risk operational situations prior to exposing man to them. Animal surrogates would be used to obtain data that would be meaningful in evaluating the danger to man. This is the preliminary, all-important step in space research that the U.S. insists on being successful before a man makes an orbital flight. NASA and its counterparts in Russia have been sending monkeys, mice, and dogs up in rockets for more than a decade, with none coming back alive. Human beings do not hold dominion over this earth. We don't. We've acted like we do, at least the powerful have throughout all of history and still do to this day, but it's obviously not the case. Though in our very recent past as a species through agriculture and religion, we have separated ourselves very much from other animals. Where we once lived among the mammals, birds and reptiles, we now saw them in their ways as beneath us. We separated ourselves with houses, and as time went on, a great few geniuses would develop emerging technologies that propelled all of humanity forward. Sailing ships became steam-powered, mail was outrun by telegrams, and before even the invention of the internet, we made rockets that flew through the sky and into the void of space itself, such an amazing thing yet untouched by man. For hundreds, even thousands of years, humans have often looked up to the stars and wondered not only of our place in it, but our potential to traverse them one day. And in April of 1961, the first human being, Yuri Gagarin, exited Earth's atmosphere and entered the true great beyond. But Yuri was not the first animal to enter it. That goes to fruit flies in 1947. But what about the title of uh, primates, mammals even? Surely that record can go to the human Yuri. No, that record goes to Albert II, a recess monkey that was launched into space in June 1949. He died upon re-entry. He did not volunteer to be launched into space, and his death was but one of many. This video will go over the stories of the many monkeys and apes that were sent into the void. But first, I just want to say welcome back, one and all, to the review series on YouTube that matters most, Monkey in Review. Whether the weather be weathered for furry friends across our genetic branches or not, we'll be here to review the best and brightest among us. This video will be different from the others. It'll be the first of a three-part mini-series where I go over not one notable Monkey, but several within a field of human endeavors. Today's topic is Monkeys in Space. If you want a comprehensive documentary about this subject, at least the ape part, then check out One Small Step, the story of the Space Chimps. It's a 2008 documentary film produced and directed by David Cassidy and Kristen Davey. The film chronicles the real story behind the early use of chimpanzees in space exploration. Coincidentally, also in 2008, the film Chimps in Space released. As far as I can find, that was just a coincidence, and the films share only a superficial resemblance. As I stated at the top, before humans went into space, several other animals were used, including numerous non-human primates, so that scientists could investigate the biological effects of spaceflight. In an article written by Tara Gray on NASA's own website, quote, Before humans actually went into space, one of the prevailing theories of the perils of spaceflight was that humans might not be able to survive long periods of weightlessness. 
For several years, there had been a serious debate among scientists about the effects of prolonged weightlessness. American and Russian scientists utilized animals, mainly monkeys, chimps, and dogs, in order to test each country's ability to launch a living organism into space and bring it back alive and unharmed." Unquote. The United States launched flights containing primate passengers primarily between 1948 to 1985. France launched two monkey-carrying flights in 1967. The Soviet Union had their fair share of primate launches, but more recently, from 1983 all the way up until 1996. And then there's China, Argentina, and Iran, but we'll get to them in due time. Overall, it's been recorded that 32 non-human primates flew in the space program. None flew more than once. Most were anesthesiated before liftoff. And numerous backup primates also went through the programs, but never flew. Of all the animals used by humans in spaceflight, the non-human primates included were recess macaques, crab-eating macaque, squirrel monkeys, pigtail macaques, and chimpanzees. The most detailed primates we'll cover were from the U.S. flights, only because they were the least shady about it. After doing the research I did, I'm under the opinion that what public records exist about this must only scratch the surface for the other countries. The first primate launched into subspace was Albert, a recess macaque who on June 11, 1948, rode a rocket flight to over 63 kilometers in Earth's atmosphere on a V-2 rocket. Albert died of suffocation during the flight and may actually have died in the cramped space capsule before launch. The capsule was redesigned before the next flight to enlarge the quarters. On June 14, 1949, our boy Albert II made the record for first primate and mammal to pass the quote, Carmen line of 100 kilometers, which designates the beginning of space. His flight reached 132 kilometers before coming back down where he died upon re-entry. A parachute failure caused his capsule to strike the ground at high speed. Albert's respiratory and cardiological data were recorded up to the moment of impact. On September 16, 1949, Albert III died below the Kármán line at 35,000 feet in an explosion of his V-2. On December 8, Albert IV, the second mammal in space, flew on the last monkey V-2 flight and died on impact after another parachute failure after reaching 130.6 kilometers. Monkeys later flew on the Aerobi rockets. On April 18, 1951, a monkey, possibly called Albert V, died due to parachute failure. On September 20th, 1951, Yorick, also called Albert VI, along with 11 mouse crewmates, reached 236,000 feet, or 72 kilometers, and came down, successfully surviving the landing. He was the first monkey to do so. Though the dogs Desik and Tizgan had survived a trip to space in July of that year, although he died two hours later. Two of the mice also died after recovery. All of the deaths were thought to be related to stress from overheating in the sealed capsule in the New Mexico sun while awaiting the recovery team. The Albert names were put to rest after this flight. Patricia and Mike, two crab-eating monkeys, flew on May 21, 1952, and survived, but their flight was only 26 kilometers. On December 13, 1958, Gordo, also called All Reliable, a squirrel monkey, survived being launched aboard Jupiter AM-13. After flying for over 1,500 miles and reaching a height of 310 miles, or 500 kilometers, Giorgio came back down over the South Atlantic, only to be killed due to a mechanical error with the parachute recovery system in the nose of the rocket. Despite the loss of Gordo, the mission was considered a success by NASA. It had gone some way towards alleviating the concerns over how the human body would cope with weightlessness and the difficulties of space travel. On May 28, 1959, aboard the Jupiter AM-18, Abel, a recessed macaque, and Miss Baker, a squirrel monkey from Peru, flew a successful mission. They traveled in excess of 16,000 kilometers an hour and withstood 38 Gs, coming in at 373 miles per second squared. 
Abel died June 1, 1959, while undergoing surgery to remove an infected medical electrode from a reaction to the anesthesia, while Baker took home the title of becoming the first monkey to survive the stresses of spaceflight and the related medical procedures that came after. Baker would later die November 29, 1984, at the age of 27, and is buried in the grounds of the United States Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Abel was preserved and is now on display at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum. On December 4, 1959, from Wallops Island, Virginia, Sam, a recess macaque, flew on the Little Joe 2 in the Mercury program to 53 miles high. On January 21, 1960, Miss Sam, also a recess macaque, followed on Little Joe 1B, although her flight was only to 8 miles, or 13 kilometers, in a test of emergency procedures. Chimpanzees Ham and Enos flew in the Mercury program, with Ham becoming the first great ape, or hominidae, in space. The name Ham was an acronym taken from the laboratory that prepared him for his historic mission, the Holloman Aerospace Medical Center. His name was also in honor of the commander of the laboratory, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton Ham Blackshear. However, this wasn't always the case. There was originally 40 chimpanzee flight candidates in Holloman. After evaluation, the number of candidates was reduced to 18, then to 6, including Ham. Officially, Ham was known as number 65 before his flight, and only renamed Ham upon his successful return to Earth. This was reportedly because officials did not want bad press that would come from the death of a named chimpanzee if the mission were to fail. But despite this, among his handlers, number 65 had also been known as Chop Chop Chang. So what did Ham do? During his pre-flight training, Ham was taught to push a lever within a five seconds of seeing the flashing blue light. Failure to do so resulted in an application of a light electric shock to the soles of his feet while a correct response earned him a banana pellet. In January 31, 1961, Ham was secured in a Project Mercury mission designated MR-2 and launched from Cape Cadaveral, Florida on a suborbital flight. Ham's vital signs and tasks were monitored by sensors and computers on Earth. The capsule suffered a partial loss of pressure during the flight, but Ham's spacesuit prevented him from suffering any harm. Ham's lever-pushing performance in space was only a fraction of a second slower than on Earth, demonstrating that tasks could be performed in space. Ham's capsule splashed down to the Atlantic Ocean and was recovered by the USS Donner later that day. His only physical injury was a bruised nose. His flight was 16 minutes and 39 seconds long. The results from his test flight led directly to the mission Alan Shepard made on May 5, 1961 aboard Freedom 7. Ham later retired and lived another 17 years at North Carolina Zoo. After his death on January 19, 1983, Ham's body was given to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology for Necropsy. The plan was to have him stuffed and placed on display at the Smithsonian Institution following a Soviet precedent with pioneer space dogs Belka and Strelka. However, this plan was abandoned after a negative public reaction. Ham's skeleton was held in the collection of the National Museum of Health and Medicine, Silver Spring, Maryland, and the rest of Ham's remains were buried at the International Space Hall of Fame in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Ham is survived by numerous works of art done by him or inspired by him, including Ray Allen and the Embers released the song Ham the Space Monkey in 1961, Tom Wolfe's 1979 book The Right Stuff, which depicts Ham's space flight, as do its 1983 film and 2020 TV adaptations. The 2001 film Race to Space is a fictionalized version of Ham's story. The chimpanzee in the film is named Mac. In 2007, a French documentary made in association with Animal Planet, Ham, Astro Chimp No. 65, tells the story of Ham as witnessed by Jeff, who took care of Ham until his departure from the Air Force Base. The 2008 3D animated film Space Chimps follows anthropomorphic chimpanzees and their adventure in space. The primary protagonist is named Ham 3, depicted as the grandson of the real-life Ham. And in 2008, Bark, Hyde, and Horm, a folk hill rock band from Portland, Oregon, released a song titled Ham the Astro Chimp, detailing the journey of Ham from his perspective. 
Following Ham came Enos. Enos was the second chimpanzee launched into space by NASA. He was the first and only chimpanzee and third hominid after cosmonauts Yuri Gagarin and German Titov to orbit the Earth. Enos's flight occurred on November 29, 1961. He completed more than 1,250 training hours at the University of Kentucky and Holloman Air Force Base. Training was more intense for him than his predecessor Ham because Enos was going to be exposed to weightlessness and higher Gs for longer periods of time. His training included psychomotor instructions and aircraft flights. Enos was selected for his Project Mercury flight only three days before launch. He completed his first orbit in one hour and 28 minutes. Enos was scheduled to complete three orbits, but the mission was aborted after two due to two issues capsule overheating, and a malfunctioning avoidance conditioning test subjecting the primate to 76 electrical shocks. The capsule was brought aboard the USS Stormies in the late afternoon, and Enos was immediately taken below deck by his Air Force handlers. Enos's flight was a full dress rehearsal for the next Mercury launch on February 20th, 1962, which would make John Glenn the first American to orbit Earth after astronauts Alan Shepard Jr. and Gus Grimson's successful suborbital space flights. On November 4, 1962, Enos died of shingalosis related dysentery, which was resistant to then known antibiotics. He was constantly observed for two months before his death. Pathologists reported no symptoms that could be attributed or related to his previous space flight, so that was not the cause. While Ham is the more famous of the two chimps, Enos will always be remembered. But the humans were not done. The test flights continued. Goliath, a squirrel monkey, died in an explosion in his Atlas rocket on November 10th, 1961. A recessed macaque called Scadback flew a suborbital flight on December 20th, 1961, but was lost at sea after landing. Bonnie, a pigtailed macaque, flew on Biosatellite 3, a mission which lasted from June 29th to June 8th, 1969. This was the first multi-day monkey flight, but came after longer human space flights were common. He died within a day of landing. Space Lab 3 on the Space Shuttle Flight STS-51B featured two squirrel monkeys named number 3165 and number 384-80. The flight was from April 29th to May 6th, 1985. And that covers all of NASA's recorded non-human space flights. From here, we will now venture to a country that once tried to rule the world, France. France launched a pig-tailed macaque named Martin on a Vesta rocket on March 7th, 1967, and another named Pirette on March 13th. These suborbital flights reached 243 kilometers and 234, respectively. Martin became the first monkey to survive more than a couple hours after flying above the international definition for the edge of space. And that ends the tale of France in this entry. Next, we will travel to Argentina. On December 23, 1969, as part of the Operation Navidad, Operation Christmas, Argentina launched Juan a tufted capuchin native to Argentina's Michons province, using a two-stage Regal 04 rocket. It ascended perhaps up to 82 kilometers and then was recovered successfully. Other sources give 30, 60, or 72 kilometers. All of these are below the international definition of space. Later on February 1st, 1970, the experience was repeated with a female monkey of the same species using an X-1 Panther rocket. Although it reached a higher altitude than its predecessor, it was lost after the capsule's parachute failed. The Soviet Russia space program used only recessed macaques in its Bion satellite program in the 1980s and 1990s. The name of the monkeys began with sequential letters of the Russian alphabet, which I will display here but cannot say myself. The animals all survived their missions but for a single fatality in post-flight surgery, after which the program was cancelled. The first monkeys launched by Soviet space program, Abrik and Bion, flew on Bion 6. 
They remained aloft from December 14, 1983 to December 20th, 1983. Next came Bion 7 with monkeys Verney and Gordy from July 10th, 1985 until July 17th, 1985. Then came Dryoma and Yurosha on Bion 8 from September 29th, 1987 to October 12th. After returning from space, Dryoma was presented to Cuban leader Fidel Castro, though that claim needs some citations. Bion 9 with monkeys Zaconia and Zabayaka followed from September 15, 1989 to September 28, 1989. The two took the space endurance record for monkeys at 13 days, 17 hours in space. Monkeys Ivasha and Krosh flew on Bion 10 from December 29, 1992 to January 7, 1993. Krosh produced offspring after rehabilitation upon returning to Earth. Lapik and Multik were the last monkeys in space until Iran launched one of its own in 2013, but we'll get there. The pair flew aboard Bion 11 from December 24, 1996 to January 7, 1997. Upon return, Maltic died while under anesthesia for U.S. biopsy sampling on January 8. Lapik nearly died while undergoing the identical procedure. No follow-up research has been conducted to determine whether these two incidents, together with the 1959 loss of the U.S. monkey Abel in post-flight surgery, contraindicate the administration of anesthesia during or shortly after space flights. Further U.S. support of the Bion program was cancelled. The PRC spacecraft Shenzhou-2 launched on January 9, 2001. It is rumored that inside the re-entry module, precise information is lacking due to the secrecy surrounding China's space program, a monkey, dog, and a rabbit rode aloft in a test of the spacecraft's life support systems. The SZ-2 re-entry model landed in Inner Mongolia on January 16th. No images of the recovered capsule appear in the press, leading to the widespread inference that the flight ended in failure. According to press reports citing an unnamed source, a parachute connection malfunction caused a hard landing. On January 28, 2013, AFP and Sky News reported that Iran had sent a monkey in a Pishgum rocket to the height of 72 miles, or 116 kilometers, and they then retrieved the quote shipment. Iranian media gave no details on the timing or location of the launch, while details that were reported raised questions about the claim. Pre-flight and post-flight photos clearly showed different monkeys. You sussy baka! The confusion was due to the publishing of an archive photo from 2011 by the Iranian Student News Agency, or ISNA. According to Jonathan McDowell, a Harvard astronomer, quote, they just mixed that footage with the footage of the 2013 successful launch, unquote. On December 14, 2013, AFP and BBC reported that Iran sent a monkey to space and safely returned it again. Recess Macaque, Aftab, from January 28, 2013, and Fargum, from December 14, 2013, were each launched separately into space and safely returned. Researchers continue to study the effects of the space trip on their offspring. To quote Tara Gray again, Over the past 50 years, American and Soviet scientists have utilized the animal world for testing. Despite losses, these animals have taught the scientists a tremendous amount more than could have been learned without them. Without animal testing in the early days of the human space program, the Soviet and American programs would have suffered great losses of human life. These animals performed a service to their respective countries that no human could or would have performed. They gave their lives and or their service in the name of technological advancement, paving the way for humanity's many forays into space." Unquote. That is how her article ends. And listen. She's just a writer, so this isn't directed at her, but to all the scientists involved in animal experimentations at present? Stop it! Get help, goddamn you! Words like, quote, utilized the animal world for testing can easily be replaced with abused the animal worlds for testing. Because why sugarcoat it? If you're fine with abusing animals, then who am I to stop you? 
There are hints in the reports that some animals were recovered after a tipping point, but they were brought to those tipping points because of the scientists. We still find it so easy to use living intelligent creatures like clay due to a morphed human-centric worldview of domination, but we have to stop it. If you get a donkey to carry your bags for you, feed it a carrot. But if you strap 50 donkeys to a giant motor and whip them endlessly while feeding them pellets, well, it's not the same thing, clearly. We can use animals in ways that don't abuse them, but to abuse animals, like shocking their feet to learn, or just physically stuffing them in tiny compartments where they quickly die, it's just not right in my eyes. Do I find space fascinating? Yes. Do I want to go into space one day? Yeah. And part of that is grappling with the understanding that our space flight knowledge as a species comes off the back of so many dead primates. Would it make something like advancing to other worlds where we as a collective species might do better protecting other primates from ourselves make it worth it? Or is it just impossible to get everyone on the same page? I don't know, but I hope it's the former. As we close today's video off, I just want to press a question. How do you guys feel about animal testing in general? Do you feel like we can move past it at this point? Do we have the technology to simulate what we would otherwise need test subjects for? Let me know. Thank you as always for checking out my monkey in review. Make sure to like and subscribe to spread the sacred word of monkeys far and wide. I've been your host and ambassador of Primate Nash, Joe Van. As always, I appreciate your time. Wish you nothing but monkey love in your life. And wish you all sleep well, fellow primates. Until next time, bye bye